Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Atlantic Council. I'm Ellen Tauscher, former member of the House, former Under Secretary of State. I'm Vice Chair of the Atlantic Council, Scowcroft Skinner, and I'm a member of the Council's Board of Directors. I'm really pleased to welcome you all to today's event featuring Representative Seth Moulton of the 6th Congressional District of Massachusetts, who will give the Atlantic Council's America's role in the world address today. Today's event is part of the strategic initiative of the Council's Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security. This flagship series provides a platform for prominent leaders to share their perspectives on how America should navigate the tumultuous and dynamic global environment. We think this is an important series to host, especially now, because we're in a time of transition, not only in politics, but in world leadership. Yesterday, or actually very early this morning, we had the results from the Iowa primary. As you know, we had five winners, two from the Republican, two from the Democratic side, and three from the Democratic side. Two, two from the Democratic side and three from the Republican side. Uh, and we think that um, this kind of engagement is important uh, because it will be part of the conversation that will shape the course of the next US presidential election. Uh, we're seeing less activists Americans' uh, role in the world, uh, and we're seeing other actors, both state and non-state actors, start to position themselves more prominently on the global stage. Last year, we hosted then-presidential candidate Senator Lindsey Graham, where he gave an impassioned plea for a more robust American presence in the world. We also hosted my former colleague, House Armed Services Chairman Mac Thornberry and HASC Ranking Member Adam Smith for their takes on America's strategic defense priorities. As expected, they differed greatly on a defense and security strategy for the United States, but that is what this series is meant to do, to promote dialogue among our political leaders on how the United States should operate in the world. Please continue to engage with us on the series as we have other speakers lined up to address these critical issues, including Utah Senator Mike Lee on March 10th. As this is a presidential election year, it is the right time for many of our leaders as possible to get involved in this debate. But today I'm honored to have a chance to introduce Congressman Moulton before he delivers his important America's role in the world address. Before I tell you a little bit about him, I also want to let you know that this event is off the record and that we are live streaming it, and that we are live tweeting the discussion from the handle at AC Scowcroft, and with the hashtag AC Strategy. So more about the congressman. 
After graduating from Harvard, Congressman Moulton joined the U.S. Marine Corps, where he served four terms in Iraq as an infantry officer, including two tours as a platoon commander and two tours as a special assistant to G General David Petraeus, where he helped lead counterinsurgency operations south of Baghdad in 2005 and during the surge. He left the Marines in 2008 with the rank of captain. He was then elected to Congress in 2014 on a platform of bringing new bipartisan leadership to Congress. In this, his first term, the congressman is focused on economic growth for Massachusetts families and in improving veterans' health care through the VA, where he still receives his care. He serves on the House Armed Services Committee, the House Budget Committee, and the House Small Business Committee. Today, he adds Atlantic Council Speaker to his long list of accomplishments. Congressman, welcome to the Atlantic Council, and the floor is yours. Ellen, um, thank you very much. It doesn't seem right that she's introducing me and not the other way around, um, but I'm incredibly grateful. Thank you. And thank you to the Atlantic Council the, and to the Scowcroft Center for hosting me. It truly is an honor to be here with you today. And thanks to all of you for welcoming this dialogue. I look forward to your questions and comments, so please don't be shy. The world is more complicated and changing more rapidly than ever before. But one thing must remain the same, the need for strong American leadership. Regardless of your view on President Obama's leadership, congressional troublemaking, and the increasingly vitriolic 2016 presidential campaign, there is no question that today in 2016, many of our allies feel concerned and many of our enemies feel emboldened. We have a chance for a reset in January 2017, and we need to take advantage of that opportunity to ensure the U.S. is well positioned for both the challenges and opportunities in the years ahead. The best way to do that can be summed up in a phrase that became the motto of the 1st Marine Division in which I served under General James Mattis. No better friend, no worse enemy. In America, you will find no better friend, and in America, you will find no worse enemy. So let's talk about no better friend first. We are our, at our best when we act with our allies to tackle the world's toughest challenges. We all know this from history, and I have seen it on the ground in Iraq, where I served alongside British, Polish, and Iraqi troops, where I, was, where I served four tutees of, tours of duty in the Marines. Working with our coalition partners wasn't always easy, but it was far better that they were there. Working with our allies gives us strength. It gives us a leverage to do more than we have the capacity to do on our own, and importantly, it gives us credibility. Standing here at the Atlantic Council, founded just over a decade after the Second World War, with a mission of fostering and encouraging the cooperation between North America and Europe, I cannot overstate the importance of our ongoing relationships with our closest allies, including the United Kingdom, France, Germany, and other European allies with whom we share unprecedented common history, culture, values, and commitment to ideals. Even our closest friendships will suffer if not regularly reaffirmed. In Eastern Europe, we supported countries as they democratized after the fall of the Soviet Union, and we must continue to support them in the face of Russian aggression today. When I visited Eastern Europe last year, together with the chair of the Armed Services Committee, we could feel the concerns, dare I say, the fear of Russia among the Eastern European officials we met. Hearing stories of Polish citizens lining the roads as American tanks rolled in to train, and saying, we've been waiting 75 years for the Americans to come, it was powerful. Some of the Polish troops I served with and befriended in Iraq used to joke about their low morale, but the Polish troops we met on this trip were incredibly enthusiastic to be training with Americans. And the American generals eagerly detailed their plans to survey bridges in Eastern Europe to extend further east their 1950s plans to counter a Red Army invasion. 
But while we're executing tank drills and surveying bridges, the Russian army is conducting cutting-edge hybrid warfare to counter NATO's influence. They're initiating daily cyber attacks against our NATO allies, undermining their political leaders with sophisticated propaganda, and recruiting local support through their version of Voice of America. We need to provide more than tank parades and 50-year-old Cold War strategy to counter a rapidly innovating Russian threat. In the Middle East, as we face the barbarity and depravity that is ISIS, a changing Iran and the heart of the Arab world in flux, we must engage more deeply with our allies and make it clear the U.S. has no intention of abandoning the region at perhaps its most pivotal moment in centuries. We must remain committed to our closest partner in the region, Israel, with whom we share deep political, social, cultural, and economic ties. At the same time, our Arab allies are best positioned to be at the forefront of the fight against ISIS. And we must intensify coordination and regional diplomacy with our allies in the Gulf and the Levant. When I was in Israel last summer, we heard from a veteran journalist who said, America will be hated for doing too much in the Middle East, and America will be hated for doing too little in the Middle East. You should always do too much. It resonated with an answer I received from President Ghani to a question I posed to him in Kabul in February. I was on the first congressional delegation to meet with the new president of Afghanistan, and he talked optimistically about organizing an Arab coalition to take on ISIS. He might as well have told our small bipartisan team of U.S. congressmen that he was making an anonymous donation to the U.S. Treasury. It was music to our ears to hear about bringing regional allies together to fight ISIS. So I asked him, I said, Mr. President, what can the U.S. do to support this effort? And maybe, maybe I said, the best thing we can do is just get out of the way. To that, he responded, absolutely not. Whether you like it or not, he continued, the U.S. Fifth Fleet is the only thing holding the situation together right now in the Middle East, in the Persian Gulf. And even if it's just telling the right people to come to the table, U.S. leadership is needed. We need to provide that leadership and that continuous, heavily engaged diplomatic presence to our allies in the Middle East. Third, in East Asia, we have enormous interests, not only economic, but political. And China is our only true geopolitical peer. China will continue to grow and expand its influence in the region and in emerging markets across the world. We must show our commitment to our long-standing treaty allies, Japan and Taiwan, through strengthened commercial and defense ties as we work to deepen our relationships with the thriving economies of ASEAN, who find themselves looking for U.S. leadership in the face of often one-sided Chinese engagement. So those are three ways in Europe, the Middle East, and in East Asia that the United States can be a better friend to our allies. Simultaneously, we, much, we must match the depth of commitment we have to our allies with our depth of commitment to defeating our enemies. First, this means defeating ISIS. ISIS is a national security threat to the United States. And so we must have a serious, comprehensive strategy to defeat ISIS. Doing so requires a whole-of-government approach. And as a Marine infantry veteran who found himself doing a lot of reconstruction work in Iraq that should have been handled by the State Department, I will say up front that this comprehensive strategy must be guided and underpinned by a political and diplomatic plan to ensure the peace. This was the huge mistake we made after we left Iraq, disengaging politically and thereby allowing a political vacuum to develop in Iraq that ISIS swept in to occupy. ISIS didn't just come in and defeat the Iraqi army. The Iraqi army put its weapons down and went home because it had lost faith in its government. As a veteran of the surge, where I saw many young Americans killed and wounded in a heroic effort to turn that misguided war around, it was hard to return to Baghdad as a member of Congress and see so much of what we had fought for and achieved during the surge gone to waste. Now, under the president who vowed to pull us out of Iraq, 
We've sent Americans back in just five years after we left. We must not repeat this mistake again. Not, in, not again in Iraq, not as we withdraw from Afghanistan, and not with whatever we do in Syria. I've been to Iraq and Afghanistan and to many of our surrounding Middle Eastern bases, and I have reasonable confidence in our military plans to defeat ISIS. But I still do not have confidence in our diplomatic plans to ensure the peace, to ensure that after our troops do their job, we won't find the next ISIS emerging to occupy a new political vacuum we leave in our wake. Our political plans must guide our military effort, not the other way around, as is too often the case today. I was particularly shocked to receive several briefings from our commanders in the Middle East that contained phases one through three of a military operation, but nothing about phase four, the reconstruction and stability operations, as if this wasn't perhaps the single biggest lesson we learned from the Iraq invasion in 2003. A serious political plan means well-defined political goals in both Iraq and Syria, and a diplomatic plan to ensure their success, both in concert with military action and following on from it. And thus, this must all begin with much more serious engagement from our Department of State. Ambassador Crocker, the rightly celebrated co-lead of the surge with General Petraeus, has suggested that Secretary Kerry begin by spending two weeks in Baghdad himself. Regardless of whether or not the Secretary does that this year, our next Secretary of State should. At a high level, these political plans should support the Abadi government in Iraq, they should give more power to the Sunnis, and they should counter Iranian influence. The Iraqi government must be more federalist, but I am personally not of the belief that splitting up the country will improve things. I would rather see Iraqi politicians bickering over oil revenues in parliament than fighting over borders in the Iraqi desert. While I don't claim to be a diplomatic expert, I would be happy to explore these specifics in greater detail. But the key point is that we must have a clear plan. And everyone in our counter-ISIS effort, whether a social media hacker in Maryland or a special forces captain outside Mosul, must understand this plan clearly, and it must guide all of our efforts. And foundational to this mission must be developing Sunni-backed local forces to hold the peace. This will be difficult, this will be frustrating, but it's the only way to ensure lasting success in the parts of Iraq ISIS threatens or controls. It would be more convenient in the short term to arm the Kurds because they are great and trustworthy fighters. It would be more convenient in the short term to employ the Shiite militias because they are already organized and equipped. But the only way to make this work in the end is with Sunni forces who believe in the mission, are empowered to succeed, and have a stake in the political future of their country. In Syria, one of the most complex, destructive civil wars the world has ever seen continues to devastate the country, killing hundreds of thousands and creating over 12 million refugees. Syria is more complicated than Iraq, and related to what we do there as well, of course, but the principle remains the same. A serious political and diplomatic strategy must underpin and guide our military actions. And I don't think we've had that for some time. For example, if you listen to what the administration has been saying, it sounds like they are planning for a diplomatic transition from Assad's leadership. Yet by arming various opposition groups without a clear and coherent, coherent plan for what they will do, you would think they are pushing for overthrowing the Assad government militarily. It's an incoherent strategy. And it's worth pointing out here, as much as it pains me to do so, that Russia is doing much better on this count. Every 18-year-old Russian kid from Kursk knows his country's strategic political plan in Syria, the mission that he is ultimately fighting to support. It's to keep Assad in power. It's a terrible mission that is fundamentally opposed not only to our goals in Syria, but to their own. But regardless of the wisdom of the mission, the point is that their mission is clear. I'm afraid ours is not. Any U.S. troops that play a role in training or partnering with these forces in Syria must be given a clear mission to include a clear political end state and the resources and commitment to win. 
The principal task must be redoubling efforts recently revived by Secretary Kerry and the contact group in Geneva in organizing a political transition from the Assad regime. This may require organizing a stronger opposition, not just training and equipping them militarily, but organizing them politically. Overthrowing the regime militarily has simply not worked to date despite military assistance to the opposition. And as in Iraq, the only way to ensure such a transition is lasting, both politically and militarily, is to ensure we have Sunni-backed local forces to hold the peace. Second, beyond the Middle East and, critical, and the critical turning point Iraq and Syria both face, we must stand up to Russian aggression and its efforts to flout the basic tenets of international conduct. Churchill famously declared Russia a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. But perhaps there is a key. That key is the Russian national interest. Much has changed since Churchill's time, but some things have not. The U.S. and our allies continue to work with Russia when those interests converge, but increasingly they do not. When Russia works with us on international problems, it is easier to resolve them. Russia worked with the U.S. on the Iran deal without Russian assistance shipping out Iranian uranium stocks and pressure on Iranian leadership to accept the deal in its final hours. The historic nuclear agreement may not have happened. But often in Syria, in Europe, and a host of other places, Russia has not worked with the international community and continues to violate sovereign borders, flout international law, and ignore basic human rights. In Ukraine, former President Viktor uh, Yanukovych was a Russian client who led a government which collapsed out of a hollow rod of corruption and lack of popular support. A popular movement coalesced against him amongst the citizenry, citizenry that yearned for greater engagement with Europe and modernization that Russia simply could not provide. In Syria, Russia continues to support the brutal Assad regime, clinging to the vestiges of its only surviving Middle Eastern client. Its haphazard intervention meant to benefit the Assad regime has targeted opposition groups, not ISIS, which often stand the best chance of making gains against the regime and defending civilians against the horrific violence of regime onslaughts. Contrary to popular belief, this is not a Russian state operating from a position of strength. Much to the contrary, this is a country in decline, desperately seeking to restore vestiges of its past glory. Inflation continues with the ruble whipsawing violently. In 2015 alone, it lost half its value against the dollar. Sanctions plague Russia's financial sector, costing it as much as 1.5% of GDP, and its heavy outmoded reliance on oil as a principal source of state revenue at a time when prices are at an all-time low jeopardizes its strength. Russia's desperate situation is precisely what makes it so dangerous and precisely what should concern us here in the U.S. An emboldened President Putin increasingly driven towards rash, short-term calculations. Without a proactive, effective strategy to meet Russia on the advanced battlefield of hybrid warfare and counter President Putin's whole of government strategy against NATO, Russian influence will only continue to grow despite their fundamental economic weakness. Finally, along with defeating ISIS in Iraq and Syria and countering Russia's aggressive expansionism, the next administration must work to counter Iran's destabilizing actions while ensuring effective implementation of the nuclear deal. I supported the nuclear deal with Iran because it is the best option we have available today to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Since the conclusion of the deal, a number of prominent foreign policy and defense leaders have recognized its significance, including Ephraim uh, Halevi, the former head of the Mossad, as well as over 50 former high-level U.S. diplomats and senior U.S. military leaders. <coughs> Even the current chief of staff of the Israeli Defense Forces, Gadi Eisenkot, characterized the deal as an historic opportunity. Recently, the U.S. and the international community have verified that Iran has taken preliminary steps necessary to fulfill its obligations under the terms of the deal. But at the same time, Iran has fired off ballistic missiles in flagrant violation of U.N. Security Council resolutions. They continue to finance international terrorism, support our enemies, and oppose our allies. American troops that I served with in Iraq were killed by Iran and Iranian weapons. Let me be clear. The Iran nuclear deal is an important step towards preventing Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. 
but Iran remains our enemy, and the deal will only be effective if it is strongly enforced. That's why I, along with Republican Reed Ribble of Wisconsin, recently introduced a bipartisan resolution mapping out an effective path forward for the U.S. and international community for the months and years to come. This resolution first calls on the President, Congress, and our international partners to ensure the IAEA, the State Department, and the Treasury Department have the tools necessary to make sure we are inspecting and implementing the deal to the strictest, fullest extent possible. Second, the resolution urges the President to reaffirm our relationship with Israel and support our closest ally in the region with the tools it needs to defend itself. <coughs> this means continued intelligence and counterterrorism support to maintain Israel's safety against Iran, Iranian-funded groups like Hezbollah and Hamas, as well as support for increased funding for Iron Dome and David Sling. It also urges the President to act now to finalize a 10-year memorandum of understanding between the U.S. and Israel. Third, our resolution calls on the President and the international community to remain committed to countering Iran's harmful actions throughout the Middle East and across the world. While at a state level, Iran continues to fund and support the brutal Assad regime in Syria, militant activities of Hezbollah in Lebanon as well as Syria, it also supports individual terrorist actors in efforts against the U.S. and its allies. We have engaged with Iran diplomatically to keep it from obtaining a nuclear weapon. But we shouldn't have any illusions about their other activities in the region. Just last month, an Iranian-funded and supplied militia kidnapped three American contractors in Iraq. That's why I am calling on the President to act at the UN Security Council in response to the recent Iranian ballistic missile tests and to act to ensure that the US and our allies in the region increase our efforts to counter Iranian support to forces seeking to destabilize the Middle East. Just within the context of our relationship with Iran, we can see how no better friend, no worse enemy can be effectively employed. Where Iran is compliant, we uphold our diplomatic commitments without compromise. Where they continue to flout international agreements outside the nuclear deal, supporting international terrorism, threatening us and our allies, we will stand strongly against them. Countering Iran's destabilizing actions, standing up to Russia's aggressive expansionism, and defeating ISIS with a comprehensive political and military strategy for Iraq and Syria, these are three principal places where our adversaries must have no doubt that we are unwavering in our commitment to stand strongly against them. As we move to reset in January 2017 and take advantage of this turning point to strengthen our commitments to our allies and pursue a more comprehensive strategy to confronting our enemies, we must ensure that we have the tools to do so. We simply can't face the challenges and threats of the 21st century with a 20th century toolbox. This means reforming how our government uses the three critical levers at its disposal in foreign policy, defense, diplomacy, and development. First, we can't, uh, we can't address any of the threats I described or effectively worth, work with our allies if our Defense Department is still mired in 20th century ways of thinking and doing business. In order to do so, the Department must aggressively move forward on serious acquisition reform. Only by updating and making acquisition processes more agile can we provide our service members and military planners the tools they need to effectively counter the threats I outlined? Acquisition reform is also needed to prevent repeat episodes of wasted time and money on troublesome projects like the LCS and the F-35. Bringing the Pentagon fully into the 21st century also means doubling down on the third offset strategy and capitalizing on areas where the US has a decided advantage over even our most advanced adversaries. This includes next generation robotics and system autonomy, miniaturization, big data, and advanced manufacturing. Finally, our defense and intelligence community must accelerate cooperation on a new comprehensive cyber warfare, cyber warfare policy. In years to come, the cyber warfare demand domain will be highly contested, with our adversaries seeking to exploit US government and private sector vulnerabilities. Unless we more fully integrate the, the efforts of CyberCom, the service branches, and the intelligence community, I am concerned we are vulnerable to the same stovepiping the 9-11 Commission identified 
as so problematic to our counterterrorism bureaucracy. Before I ran for Congress, I had a job as the managing director of Texas Central Railway, a uh, high-speed rail project privately funded down in Dallas. I had this great office, this corner office on the 42nd floor of a downtown office building in Dallas. And I looked out at the AT&T World Headquarters across the street. I had an AT&T AT &T cell phone. And I dropped on average of three or four calls a day while looking at the AT&T World Headquarters. What's the one thing you didn't see on the World Headquarters? Cell towers. They must know they cause cancer. That was my theory. But in any event, it was extremely frustrating. And I would stand there with my AT&T cell phone looking straight out at the, at the sea level, the top of their building, dropping my phone calls. And I used to think, gosh, it would be great to have one of those rockets I used to have in my marine platoon. But here's the thing. If the Chinese felt the same way, and they were to send a squad of the Chinese army to shoot a rocket at the AT&T headquarters building, we would know exactly how we would respond as a country. But if instead the Chinese military decides to attack that headquarters through the internet, to take the personal data of everybody in this room and across the country who has an AT&T cell phone, I don't think we even know who would be in charge of the response. Is that Department of Homeland Security? Is it NSA? Is it DOD? We have some fundamental work to do. Before we even get to the details of resourcing certain programs over others, we have some fundamental do work to do in terms of our cyber warfare policy. While our military tools are an important element of working with our allies and standing up to our adversaries, our diplomatic toolbox is just as important as our defense toolbox in confronting the world's most complex challenges. Many of these challenges are at their root political problems, where military means are often a necessary but not sufficient part of the solution, just as I described in Iraq and Syria. Recently, we have seen the fruits of tough diplomacy in preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, in turning a corner with Cuba, and ending a failed Cold War era policy, and in removing Syria's de declared stocks of chemical weapons. Unfortunately, despite these gains, there are those in Congress who advocate in cutting the State Department's budget at every opportunity and advocate a smaller role for our diplomats in solving these problems. Reforming our diplomatic toolbox not only means sufficiently funding our diplomatic efforts, it also means directing and enabling our diplomats to engage with a wide variety of actors in all corners of the world. I greatly respect former Ambassador Ryan Crocker, who often speaks of expeditionary diplomacy. This is the idea that despite the risks involved, our diplomats must lead from the front, be engaged in the field, and actively partner with our military. Finally, we cannot discount the importance of international aid in our development toolbox for addressing drivers of conflict and root causes of extremism. I saw firsthand in Iraq how important the provisioning of basic services and economic livelihood was to turning the corner in public sentiment against militant groups and those that seek violence as an end. In fact, after leading one of the first platoons into Baghdad as an infantry officer, I suddenly found myself in charge of a TV station, a radio station, and a newspaper south of Baghdad. Although I was totally untrained for it, this was important development work in post-invasion Iraq. Incidentally, this was also work the State Department should have been empowered to do itself. Today, we still face many of these same challenges in Afghanistan as popular support for the national unity government wavers and reconstruction efforts wane in rural provinces, in Iraq, where Sunnis still have trouble receiving the basic services and support a government is meant to provide, and most of all in Syria, where the existence of a state structure and the most basic semblance of order has long ceased. And the, in these and other areas of the world, including Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia, USAID and multilateral development partners must be part of the solution. Only by weaving together the levers of defense, diplomacy, and development can the US effectively tackle the challenges it will face in the years to come. As we look to 2017 and a new leader in the White House, we have an opportunity to reposition ourselves in the world. We must continue to use all the tools available to us. Diplomacy must be smart and tough, our Defense Department must be cutting edge, and our development efforts must be used strategically. 
America is an indispensable global leader. And the world will be a safer place if everybody knows, from our closest allies to our fiercest foes, that there is no better friend and no worse enemy than the United States of America. Thank you. So let me start by saying thank you so much for coming here. Well, it's an uh, honor to be here, and, and thank you so us. much for all of you, you know, coming on an afternoon and staying awake even for the, for the talk. <laughs> I really with us on it. a beautiful spring-like day, oddly uh, enough. Uh, I do have one unfortunate announcement to make. We had planned to go to about 5.45. I think we can go probably until about 5.15, maybe 5. Uh, 20, and then I'm going to call time. Fortunately for you all, what that means is you won't have to listen to me so much because I'm just going to make a couple of comments, maybe ask one question, and then we're going to go straight to the audience. So please, if you have some questions, uh, ask you to put up your hand. We're going to have some microphones going around, and the usual rules uh, apply. Please identify yourself. Uh, yeah, the issue is that we have uh, questions. we have votes uh, coming up shortly, and it's an important part of my job to actually vote. So. And we want to accommodate that. So I'll just say, again, thanks for, for coming, in particular for coming for this series. And you did such a great job uh, addressing the issues that we think are so important uh, in the strategy initiative here at the Atlantic Council. I think you know that uh, what we're really trying to do is promote a more constructive and substantive dialogue on strategy, and not just the issue of the day, not just the crisis of the day. And you did such a great job doing that, really painting not only a global picture, but a long term uh, picture, thinking about what we're really trying to achieve in the long run, not just right now that might feel better, mm -hmm. but that actually addresses the situation. So I'm just going to mention a couple of things and then ask you one question, and, sure. and feel free to, to chime in on whichever, and then again, we'll go to the audience. I really liked the point, and this is something we've been struggling a lot with, and in my past job in the Pentagon, I can guarantee you has been a struggle. Uh, the point you made about how our adversaries are really employing innovative 21st century strategies and approaches, and frankly, we seem to to be continuing to employ uh, old approaches or old responses uh, to those. Uh, and the, the, uh, the gap between the two is showing more and more and becoming more and more of a challenge. So I'm really uh, glad that you raised that. I'm also particularly glad that you raised in the context of combating ISIS uh, the need for a much more holistic uh, re uh, response and really the need to address governance and development as much as we need to address the military and security part. And I've used the same line you have many times in the military absolutely necessary, but also absolutely not sufficient for a long-term uh, solution, uh, as you point out. In that area, I do hope, particularly in your role uh, on the House Armed Services Committee, that's something you can continue to pull out, particularly in election year, where we're mostly hearing about you know, either what we can bomb or how we can bomb right. things. Uh, and I would hope that, particularly in a committee setting, that's something that you all could tease out a little bit more to add to the public discourse, particularly in this very uh, important year. Yeah, I mean, this is something I've been harping on all year. And I'll tell you, there are an increasing number of voices on the, on the committee who are asking these questions. And the, the message is very consistent, not just from the diplomats, but from all the military leaders as well, that we need more of that diplomatic piece. And we frankly don't really have it right now. I think that's right. And I hope that you'll continue to press on this. The one last thing, though, that I'll, I'll add, and I'll make my question yeah. to you. And you touched on it a little bit at the end. So you've done, I think, a great job painting out uh, some big objectives for us and an approach, basically the 3D uh, approach to trying to achieve those objectives. Uh, the big question then becomes, so that's kind of the ends and the ways the means, uh, and so in particular with regard to budgeting. You touched a little bit on that uh, with the Senate, uh, but in the macro sense across the three Ds, as you know, we're in a very tough budgeting uh, environment. How do you, what do you propose in terms of trying to address this so we can have adequate resources to actually try and pursue something like this in the current budget environment? Well, look, it's, it's very tough, and uh, you know, Admiral Mullen has said that the greatest threat to American foreign, you know, to American leadership in the world is the budgetary situation we face in the United States. Uh, every military leader came before the committee over the past year and said, you've got to end this funny business with trying to fund the base budget through OCO. And at the very end, the Republicans caved in on this, um, but it took a long time to get there. Mm. Uh, so that, uh, that, needs to, that needs to stop. I mean, the Rep I also sit on the budget committee. And the intersection between the Armed Services Committee and the Budget Committee is very interesting. In, the, in last year's Budget Committee report, the Republican majority said, 
we can never again fund the base budget of Department of Defense through OCO, but that's exactly what they did hmm. this year. So there are a lot of places where we need to be more honest, but we also need to be more honest on the committee about what the real needs of the Department of Defense are. And I proposed a tough amendment this year to not increase funding above the department's request for the A-10. And I was opposed by someone who happens to be an A-10 pilot from the district with the biggest A-10 base in the country. And uh, a, a colleague and a friend. I mean, I was literally in a workout group with her this morning. So I mean, we, you know, we get on a lot of issues. But when the Air Force says, we don't want any more of this airplane, and we want to be able to take those funds and invest it in other things, and when there are unfunded requirements in the Department of Defense budget, things like for IED protection, then we've got a real problem. So my amendment would have shifted money from the A-10s that the Defense Department didn't even ask for into unfunded requirements for IED protection. Everybody told me I won the debate. People were patting me on the back just before the vote. And then every Republican voted against it. And what later emerged was, an amend was a little memo that had said, these are amendments you can't vote for, because of course, she also had the, the closest congressional election last year. And I respect her point of view, and I, and I deeply respect her. And she's a veteran. I, I deeply respect her service. But I think that when it comes to parochial issues like this, you know, we can't just be voting for our district. We've got to be voting for the national defense of the United States. And some people called me on this, said, well, Seth, you know, if it was something in your district, you'd be standing up for it. Well, actually, the toughest city in my district, the biggest city, the city where I am focusing my economic development efforts back at home is the city of Lynn. And the biggest employer in the city of Lynn is GE Aircraft, where they make the engines for the A-10. So proposing that amendment did nothing for my reelection prospects. At least not in a positive way. <laughs> but I think it's the right thing to do for our national defense. And I think we need more of that thinking on the committee to get out of the legacy programs that everybody in Congress loves. So one of my questions to the Secretary of Defense this year was, can you name for me the top five program, weapon systems or programs that you want to cut, but we here on the committee won't let you? This was not a popular question <laughs> for my colleagues. He said, I can't name five, but I'll give you a list of 20. <laughs> so this, this is a problem, and, it, and it's, it's one piece of the puzzle, but right. I think it, it hopefully helps to answer right. your question. But an ongoing challenge uh, yeah. as well, clearly. OK, we've got about 10 minutes left, so I want to make sure uh, we get to some questions. Ma'am, can we start with you? you there will be right here. I'm Eleanor Bachrock. I served in with USAID in Iraq uh, until mid-2010, so. Wow, thank you for your service. Well, not as much as yours, but. Uh, no, it's very important. Mm -hmm. And I've worked very closely mm -hmm. with some USAID folks, so. Right. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was there when they were carrying out the George W. Bush decision to withdraw troops uh, at that time. and. You're certainly, and we also supported the election that we hoped would come out well, not certain. Um, you, so it's clear that things haven't gone well, but what uh, uh, we actually increased, though, the number of diplomatic AID, et cetera, uh, staff in country after the military left. I think we even brought back Ryan Crocker as ambassador, though I may be wrong. Uh, um, but anyway, the, my question is, um, what, um, if we'd left the troops there, I just can't see any way we'd ever have, ever get them out. And now it seems even more problematic. So uh, what is your view on all this? Sure, it's a great question. I, I don't think that we should have left a ton of troops in Iraq. But we needed to probably have enough to ensure the diplomatic success. And we may have had some diplomats and development folks in Iraq, but we clearly haven't had enough. So I think that there were some real key strategic decisions that we made in the withdrawal. There were mistakes. We essentially, to summarize, we really pulled out too quickly. But the key is not that having a lot of US troops on the ground. The key is being very heavily engaged diplomatically. And General Dunford testified before the committee. And he said, he said that lack of dipl diplomatic integration 
with the Iraqi government, having our advisors in the prime minister's office, in the ministries. When we pulled them out, that's when the Iraqi government went off the rails. And look, I would have loved to have an Iraqi government that didn't need that kind of mentorship and support, but that's not the Iraqi government that we had. And here's the thing. Even if you say the only way to do that is to keep US troops in the country, I would much rather have had a few thousand US troops in the country and a stable, secure Iraq today than the chaos that we have and the need to send US troops back. That's the biggest mistake. I mean, to think that after all that we fought for, especially during the surge to turn that war around, that it's now all gone to waste and we're sending more young Americans back to fight it over all again, I can't think of a worse tragedy. And I am very concerned, if you pull up my questions to General Campbell this morning um, on, the, on, our, uh, on, his on his testimony before the committee, I'm very concerned that we're about to repeat the same thing in Afghanistan. Harlan, can I ask you to just grab the microphone across the, there you go. Um, I'm Harlan Ullman with the uh, <clears throat> Atlantic Council. Thanks for your comments. Let me preface my question with a very brief statement. When the Congress decides to vote seriously on base closing commission, then you may get some chance of reform. Hmm. But until then, I think we're whistling past the graveyard. Hmm. My question is this. I think the greatest threat facing the Department of Defense today is not the Islamic State or resurgent Russia or China, but uncontrollable internal cost growth that's running at a rate of 5 to 7% a year, everything from pencils to precision weapons to people. And acquisition is not the issue. You could fix acquisition. It's not going to save enough money. My question is, and, and McCain and Thornberry tried to address in the National Defense Authorization Act very much on the margin. Who in Congress really understands that if we don't act in the next year or two to control these costs, we're going to have a hollow force, at least a version that happened after the Vietnam War? So why is nobody addressing that? Why are we not taking action except on the margin? Aside from the possibility, this is, as I discussed with McCain, this may be a bridge too far. Well, I think Chairman Thornberry does understand it. And, and he made it clear to us in the committee that, that I mean, he acknowledged we have not done as much for acquisition reform uh, under this year's acquisition. Uh, sorry, cost control, yep. DOD reform. Um, I don't incident, I don't share your optimism about how easy acquisition reform will be. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I do agree with you that there are huge problems with cost overruns, and, and we've had a couple of people in the office recently who have detailed some of these things that you outlined. So I, I think Chairman Thornberry gets it. I think he has admitted that he's not done as much as he, uh, he wants to, and, and we'll, you'll hopefully see uh, more of that in, in the coming year. So we're going to have to let the congressman go in a minute. What I'd like to do, I think there were two questions, right? So uh, sorry, I'm just going to take the first two hands that were up. The young woman in the back here and the young gentleman up here. I'm going to ask you to just very briefly please ask your questions. And then, Congressman, I'm going to let you both answer what you can and make a closing statement, if that's sure. all right. Sure. Please, oh, go um, ahead. Quick question. Sharon Bovat, Voice of a Moderate. Um, I'm worried about gasoline prices. Recently, it was $1.49 in Chicago when I was driving here. Um, historically, when there's low gas prices, more um, things erupt, more um, outburst. Um, before 9-11, it was 99 cents a gallon. And there's historic. There's like seven different examples. My question for you, have you talked about energy independence is part of this proposal. And any other comments about that? Okay. Yeah. Harlan, would you mind? Thank you. Hi, my name is Garrett Moore. I'm a proud constituent of yours from North Andover, Massachusetts. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Um, I, my question is, I was just hearing on my way here that Syrian opposition leaders are already looking to not be part of the talks, uh, the peace talks uh, today and, and stay late this, this month. And my, my question to you is, what needs to be done, especially with our relationship with Russia, to ensure that civilian security is improved uh, five years on in the Syrian conflict? Thank you. So let me go backwards. I mean, I think this is exactly what I'm talking about, that we, it's not just enough to be sending in some special forces and dropping some arms shipments into various opposition groups that we happen to like. You know, we've got to actually organize them politically into a reasonable opposition. If we can't get done what we're doing today with the players as they exist now, sort of on the battlefield in Syria, then we've got to do more to make sure we have a credible opposition that can prevent that could present a real alternative to the Assad regime. And frankly, I don't know that that means r working with Russia. I mean, Russia is very happy that there isn't a credible alternative, that, that the Assad regime is kind of the only major player at the table. Uh, so I don't think it's about working with Russia, but I think it is about being much more 
diplomatically and politically engaged with some of these allies uh, or purported allies that we want to support militarily. You know, Thank with you. regard to at, uh, at gasoline prices, uh, I'll be honest with you, this is not a discussion that has really come up on the committee or something that we've really engaged in, other than to say that everyone in Congress believes that energy independence is helpful to the uh, United States. Uh, as someone who has the importance of infrastructure, it's incredibly frustrating to me that so many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, will admit that we need to have uh, to raise the gas tax or do something uh, to better fund transportation, and yet they won't admit it in public. And so as a result, we have, we're, not near, we're not taking advantage of this really historic opportunity um, when I think a lot of infrastructure investment would be possible. And frankly, you know, a very straightforward way to do that would be to, find, to just simply raise the gas tax um, when, it, when gasoline prices are so low. Um, so I hope, that's, I hope that's helpful. So let me thank you again. And please, let's all thank the congressman for taking time out of his day. <laughs> Uh, and especially with a vote uh, coming up. A great start to the conversation. We hope you will join us again. Thank you all for joining us as well, both here in person and online. Sorry this was slightly abbreviated, but we will invite the congressman back again and hopefully have another chance to engage as well. So thank you all for coming today. Thank you very much.